Friends, let us pray. Oh God, open our ears that we might hear you. Open our eyes that we might see you. Open our hearts to the wonders of your love. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As I was studying our gospel with Jesus giving us a litany of blessings and woes, and thinking about this being our celebration of All Saints Day, I was reminded of two of our very earliest holy women, Perpetua and Felicity. Who are Perpetua and Felicity? Well, I will tell you. <laughs> they were two women of the third century who faced persecution and were martyred for being Christians in the time of Roman oppression. Perpetua is the one who we know the most about because she kept a diary of her ordeal. Both she and Felicity were pregnant and gave birth in prison and surrendered their children to family members to raise and care for them. Perpetua's father kept pleading with her to renounce her beliefs, but she refused. She had visions while in prison, kind of like Daniel's reading of today, where she felt confirmed in her faith in Christ and her rejection of the demands of Roman society. Perpetua was supposed to devote her life to caring for her father. Instead, she devoted her life to Christ. Eventually, she and Felicity and the other Christian martyrs were brought to the amphitheater, whipped by gladiators, and then the Romans unleashed a boar, a bear, a leopard, and a wild cow to attack them. An editor finished Perpetua's diary, noting that after the wild beasts had had their way with the Christians, these Christians gave each other a kiss of peace as soldiers stabbed them with swords. Perpetua's executioner was apparently new on the job and not very skilled, so she reportedly took his weapon and helped him with joy to slash her neck. And the story ends with the extolling of the virtues of these early martyrs of Christianity. Such an account of a life certainly leaves one to ponder the meaning of, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. At the inquiry class on Wednesday night, a question came up about the saints and the meaning of the saints. Do we worship saints? The short answer is no, we don't worship them. We look to them as examples of a life well lived in a Godward direction that we should learn about and then emulate. Now fortunately, we aren't living in a time or a place where we're jailed for our Christianity. And, thanks be to God, we don't have to worry about being fed to wild animals as sport for the masses to show our faithfulness to Jesus. But what we can take from the story of two women such as Perpetua and Felicity is an example of remaining faithful. Sticking close to the source of our faith, even when all odds are stacked against us and there is enormous pressure for us to turn away from our faith. That tension still exists in our world today in big and small ways. Election season always seems to bring out the worst in us. I was once asked how the state legislature in Florida might address the problem of bullying in the schools. Well, I said, we might start with the political ads y'all run during the campaigns. Kids see their political leaders mocking and attacking each other. What do you think they're going to do in school? Um, I was never invited back to another uh, public policy meeting after that. We didn't hear this part today, but Jesus' address to the crowd with these blessings and woes was delivered 
on the plain. In Matthew's version, they're with him up on a mountain. But here in Luke, Jesus is on the level with everybody, laying out the Beatitudes. How do we take what Jesus says here? Some have read these words as saying that things like, uh, it's so much better for those who are poor and hungry and weeping when they die and go to heaven. Your life is terrible on earth. You'll be so happy when you're dead. I don't believe that's what Jesus is saying. What we must remember, especially since this is Luke's gospel, Jesus is the poor, the hungry, the weeping. Jesus is talking in the present moment, both his and ours. Jesus is a member of the oppressed and occupied Jewish people living under the rule of the Roman Empire. These words, which seem so contradictory to logic, are a way to remind his disciples, both those who were with him in the first century Palestine and those of us still following him in the 21st century, that God is with those who are facing the powers and principalities hard at work to undermine the confidence in love. Jesus is with us, especially the us being pushed aside. One man who knew this well was the 20th century theologian Howard Thurman. Thurman is among my most favorite religious thinkers. He wrote several books. His most well-known one is called Jesus and the Disinherited. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. carried it with him everywhere he went. It contained the basic ideas that would become King's nonviolent approach to the civil rights movement. Thurman had experienced racism growing up in Daytona Beach, Florida. Because he was black, there was no school for him to attend beyond the seventh grade. But Thurman was determined. He was homeschooled with the help of a school principal. He completed and passed the eighth grade and went on to live with a family member in Jacksonville, where he attended Florida Baptist Academy. He graduated from Morehouse College and earned his seminary degree, and would go on to start the Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples in San Francisco. Thurman's vision was to create a worship space where all people, white, black, brown, Asian, could come together in the presence of God, and through God, discover the common bond that weaves us all together. The church had challenges. There were disagreements. But it's still in existence today. No amount of racism or bigotry or obstacles thrown in his way would stop Thurman from pursuing the dream of building beloved community in the still very segregated era of 1940s America. Thurman drew his strength and determination from his deep belief in Jesus as one who knew what it was to be a disinherited, a, pers a person for whom society was determined to keep down and press their back against a wall. And Thurman saw how Jesus answered the hate of his day by remaining doggedly committed to acting out of a place of love. And so he made that same commitment. And while Thurman is not part of our pantheon of Episcopal saints, his is a life that one can look to and see how the light of Christ burned brightly in him. That same light exists in each one of us. We can live lives worthy of emulating. We may never start a church or go to our deaths proclaiming our faith in Christ in the face of a bitter enemy. We can see the anger and the hurt and the discord in our world and face it 
with a spirit of mercy, compassion, and love. Blessed are you who risk ridicule from the world to remain steadfastly on the side of love. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.